Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Zachary Kerajov. I work at Status on Nimbus, which is a client for Ethereum 1 and Ethereum 2 client for restri resource restricted devices written in NIM. And uh, today we'll be talking about uh, the Ethereum networking spec, uh, how it evolved, and uh, what was uh, the various uh, design rationales that uh, went into it. So, so the the first and uh, the major difference between Ethereum 1 and Ethereum 2 is that uh, we are transitioning to libp 2 p uh, which is a protocol developed by uh, Protocol Labs for the purposes of uh, developing IPFS. It's matured out of this project. And uh, I figured I should start with a few words why this transition was made and uh, why we decided to move to libp 2 p And there are, I would say, two major reasons, the two most important promises of lip 2 p And the first one is that uh, it promises to take Ethereum to many new places where it wasn't quite possible to use it before. Uh, and the reason this is possible is because all communication in lip 2 p is uh, carried all over these uh, so-called lip 2 p streams, which in turn are layered over, uh, let's call them physical connections, which could be an arbitrary network connections established between two nodes. It could be a TCP link in a classical case. It could be uh, some UDP scheme like Quick, which uh, will give us very good censorship resistance in the future. It could be the web sockets in the browser. Uh, it could even be snail mail. Now, let's don't forget the, that protocol labs, the people who created the P2P, they want a system that would work on Mars. Uh, so. One of the key features of LIP2P is that uh, it's not only uh, allowing these streams to be multiplexed over a single connection, but uh, a node in the network can relay the connections for other nodes. And uh, a single physical link can carry many logical links between arbitrary nodes. And we call this uh, multi-multiplexing in the LIP2P uh, sense. And it's, it will be the major key enabler to uh, for creating things like Ethereum light clients running in a browser. And the other significant reason is uh, gossips up, uh, this uh, framework in lip 2 p for broadcasting data. As we know, uh, a lot of uh, the traffic in a cryptocurrency network like Ethereum is about broadcasting uh, blocks, and uh, now with Ethereum 2, the majority of the traffic is actually broadcasting the attestations. The attestations are the votes that uh, the per participant in the proof of stake uh, consensus uh, exchange with, with each other. These votes allow them to reach finality and to cross link uh, the state of all the various shards, including E1. So uh, we know that from experience and from just the theoretical reasoning that uh, floods up the system where every message reaches everybody in the network is, and it's fully broadcasted on every step, just one scale to the uh, scale that we want to reach with Ethereum. Uh, but lip 2 p comes uh, with a significant cost. It, uh, it took <laughs> quite a lot of uh, convincing for the teams uh, to jump on shim because uh, when you look at the large list of components that you have to implement, it could be a little bit int intimidating. Uh, the reference code written in Go is spread over multiple repositories and uh, it's a bit hard to make sense of it. So we were uh, many teams were worried uh, whether we'll be able to make it on time. But luckily, uh, the implementation teams have uh, risen to the challenge, and uh, we now have lip 2 p implementations written in Go, JavaScript, Rust, Python, uh, Java, and NIM. And I've missed to add the C++ one developed uh, so far, not for Ethereum 2 purposes, but uh, it exists as well. And I should mention that uh, our own one, written in NIM, it uh, should be perfectly usable in C and C++ projects in the future. Uh, and what's more important is that uh, during all this implementation are currently at the stage where they can talk to each other. During the interop walk-in, uh, we demonstrated networks where all these clients were able to reach consensus over the P2P. 
Uh, but that's obviously not uh, the end of the road. We have uh, a lot of uh, work to do ahead of us. Uh, the lib P2P spec that we created for Ethereum 2 is actually divided in, you can say, two, three, two or more phases. Uh, we identified some initial targets, uh, some initial minimal set of common requirements that all the clans have to implement in, all, in order to be able to talk to each other. Uh, but these are not the underpins of a secure system. Uh, for launching mainnet, we would be changing a lot of the protocols to more modern cryptography, more modern way of doing this. We'll be adding new transports. And even this is not where the road ends. Uh, over time, there will be a lot of new high-level protocols defined for things like light clans, for the communication within shards, and so on. So just to give you an example, uh, here is a comparison between uh, this minimal interop spec and what we expect to do in, for mainnet in just a few months. We will be changing uh, the encryption framework, uh, the keys that are used to identify the nodes. Uh, we'll be switching to the sub so changing the sub-protocol negotiation scheme in lip 2 p and so on. We are introducing compression. Quite, you can say that the entire stack on every single layer there will be new developments. So in closing remarks, uh, I would like to stress out that uh, what we are creating here would be very valuable, not just for Ethereum. Like we are creating this system available in so many programming languages now that uh, could serve as the foundation layer for any kind of distributed applications in the future and decentralized. Uh, when we are ready, uh, it will be very easy for many developers to just uh, take off the shell of implementation of lip 2 p for their language and build something amazing with it. So lip 2 p is not just for Ethereum, but Ethereum, our effort will make it much, much stronger. All right, so uh, I feel that the next part of the talk will be will walk us through how do you connect to the network, uh, like what are the individual steps. Uh, the first thing you need uh, is a discovery mechanism. Uh, now, I did mention that uh, lip 2 p is uh, going to go through further evolution, but one area where it didn't quite meet the needs of Ethereum right now was uh, discovery. Uh, since uh, Ethereum has been solver, solving the discovery problem for a while, and we have identified some unique requirements like, that we want to have in the network, the existing lip 2 p solutions for discovery didn't quite meet them. So instead, uh, we decided to uh, unite the efforts for Ethereum 1 development and Ethereum 2 and it introduce a new discovery mechanism called Discover v5, which will be used in both networks. So the key features uh, that are missing in lip 2 p at this point is, uh, one, first of all, the capability advertising. This is where a node, a node can... Um, uh, make sure that uh, can be found uh, on the criteria that it supports a particular protocol. For example, this could be a node that supports um, a light client protocol and it can act as a server. And the other uh, feature is topic advertising. Now this is more about that this node has access to some resource. For example, it could be the fact that the node is currently connected to a particular shard so you can sync the information on this particular shard, and you need to find nodes which are already connected to it. Uh, and within Discovery v5, uh, there is this general purpose mechanism of attaching arbitrary data. So it's both extensible in the future for adding more relevant information, and it's uh, quite easy to adapt it to the needs of lib P2P already. So after we have found uh, other nodes on the network, uh, what we will usually do is we will start uh, listening to the broadcast, the gossip of traffic, as I mentioned. And uh, here I, I've listed uh, the few particular gossip, tr uh, gossip sub tr uh, topics that are le relevant for s kind of following the progress on the beacon chain. And we have a topic where new blocks are produced. 
Uh, we have a other topic where all the attestations are being sent, and currently in interop we use a single topic for that, so that's enough to, to monitor the whole network. But uh, what we plan to do in the future is uh, to introduce separate topics for each individual shard, <coughs> and then you'll be able to choose like uh, whether you want to listen to the traffic for finalized blocks or the traffic for attestation on a given shard. And then there are a few topics which are be getting uh, much lower amounts of traffic. These are just uh, for announcing exits when a validator wants to exit the network or for slashings when something behaves badly. Okay, and uh, again here I, I would like to stress out that if you have a lippy 2 implementation, uh, you don't have to write a full-blown client. You can just uh, implement an SSD decoder and you can tune in to the gossip of traffic and start obtaining useful information. All right, but uh, now that after we have connected, uh, LIP2P goes through a process where it uh, negotiates the protocols uh, that you can use and to exchange messages with the other clients. We call this uh, request a response uh, kind of the domain of the spec uh, and it so far it involves only few requests which are important for syncing the beacon chain and but before you start with this uh, you, when you connect to another node you start by exchanging your status information with this node and the status information in, includes uh, four bytes in identifier, which is kind of acts as a marker for the particular software version you're using. For example, you can imagine if there was as a hard fork, uh, and these four bytes will be modified in a way to indicate that you are now following different rules. And you can also be on a different network. You can be on a test net, and this again will be written in this uh, four byte identifier. And uh, the other piece of information that is exchanged is like, uh, what is the finalized route that you're currently working on and what is your head block. And obviously this is important because uh, it allows the clients to determine who should be syncing information, who is, all right, I have to be much quicker. <laughs> uh, all right, the next request is, uh, after the status message tells you whether you have to sync. So the next request is uh, your request box by a given range. And you usually do this when you are quite a bit behind. It's intended for historic blocks. Uh, and uh, it's optimized in a way that uh, the clients will be able to implement cold storage of the beacon chain. Uh, you have a database with random access and the range queries are supposed to hit only this database of, with cold storage for historic blocks. We also have a way to request recent blocks, which is uh, you request them by their hash. What you what we usually do is you connect to the network, you start listening to the attestations, you notice that uh, certain blocks, uh, for example, the attestation is referencing a block that you are missing, so you request the missing ones. And this is a little bit like syncing backwards instead of forward. Of course, I think that's all, the time all right. <laughs> uh, I'll just then finish with, um, uh, here in the end, I, I've left some links uh, for anyone who wants to dig deeper in the, this spec that I have discussed. Uh, and thank you for. Thank you.